Recently, I wanted to try the death right system by Grignard Simulations. Now, very important name, Grignard, not War Gamer, Simulations, not Games or War Games. Uh, this means that the products that are published by Grignard Simulations are for the hardcore War Gamers, not for everyone. Uh, anyways, I wanted to try the system and I picked up Death Right Cursed 11th Panzer, which is a monster game that right now during the academic year here. Unfortunately, I simply do not have the time to appreciate. I set it up, started playing it, and then I just cannot commit to gaming sessions that are long enough to really give me a sense of how the game flows and plays. Um, so, well, Luckily enough, the designer Chris Fazulu is aware that there are people like me out there that would like to try the system, do not have the time to play monster game. So he released an introductory game that can work as an introduction to the system. It gives a good sense of the main ideas of the system. It can be played in an evening or so, smaller map, not too many counters on the map. The game is called Death Ride Half It Ridge. It depicts an episode in World War II when the British attacked a position that was defended by German guns. So this is a non-symmetrical situation. The uh, British are charging, trying to attack as fast as possible, and the Germans are holding position. They do not have much mobility, but they have pretty powerful guns. They have the famous 88s. Anyways. This is the general idea. Uh, let's have a closer look and see how the game plays per se, how it works as an introduction to the system, and let's also see if you are enough for Grognard to maybe be interested in this game. This is the map. The map is actually made of two smaller maps placed adjacent to one another, and as I've done it under a piece of plexiglass, that helps. Uh, here you have the British unit at start, the British player sets up here, but he can choose which unit goes where. And this is the area where the German units are located, this is also the area where the British player is trying to go, because the mission for the British player is to take these four points here, which are guarded by German guns. The German player also has a bunch of fortifications, barbed wire, minefields that can be placed more or less in this area. I like to place them like this when I'm playing the German side because that forces the British player to converge towards the German guns or in any case to spend time trying to get across if he's trying to cross here or here and that still is a problem for the uh, British player because he will still be in range of the guns. A quick look at the counters, at the bottom right corner you have movement and the color in the background of the movement factor is relevant to indicate the type of movement that that is, then you have defense and the background color again is important, it tells you what type of defense that is. Then each unit has two weapons, a secondary weapon and a primary weapon, and these are the combat factors of the secondary and primary weapon respectively, and this is the range for the secondary and primary weapon respectively. And also again, the color in the background is important because it tells you how the combat factor for that weapon is modified depending on the situation. Also, the combat factor of the primary weapon is followed by a symbol, which may be a minus or a plus, and that again indicates that the weapon performs differently in different circumstances. So, a lot going on, a lot of information on these counters. A turn starts with several procedural phases, pretty common in war gaming, such as replacements or enforcements, but then you have a couple of other ones that are not as common. For example, you have reorganization, during which you can exchange units of yours from the map with units that have been eliminated. This represents your reorganizing units in such a way that you can bring reduced organizations closer to full strength. Then you have optional phases such as supply and command, which of course will add complexity and depth to the game. But then you have the operations phase, which is the main phase in a turn, and it is the phase during which you move your units and you use them to fire. What I like about this is that there's a huge variety of ways in which you can use your units and there isn't a specific order in which you must do things. You can use a unit to move, another one to attack, then you use a, a unit to remove barbed wire, then you move another unit through the passive that was just created, you move a unit to a position 
as to protect the advance of the other units. So during the operations phase, you can move one of your units up to its full movement value, but something like I just did may not be easy because the enemy has opportunity fire, so the enemy will probably fire at you as you spend movement points. And again, opportunity fire, as always, makes things more interactive. Both, both players are always being you know, very careful, very attentive to what's happening on the board at all times. Or you can just fire with your units, or you can fire and then move up to half of your movement factor, or you can move up to half of your movement value and then you fire, but in that case you have a penalty uh, on your attack. Also, uh, in this game, there is a type of movement called Overwatch. In this specific game, only the German player can do it. In other games in the system, uh, both players can use Overwatch. Units that are in Overwatch receive this marker. They move much slower than they would usually do, but if they manage to complete their movement without being suppressed, then they are placed on Overwatch. That means that they can respond to opportunity fire. They can fire against enemy units that are firing with opportunity fire against your own units. So this is definitely a nice protection. And it, again, it increases the level again of, in, of interaction and things that happen in each turn. Once the operation phase has been completed, units that are adjacent to units of the non-active player can launch a clause assault, which I'll talk about in a minute. During combat, you have to check if there are modifications that apply to the combat factors of the units that you're using to attack. You can combine different units in a single attack, but their combat factor may be modified by the type of unit that is firing, the weapon that is being used, uh, if the weapon is firing at short range or long range, and the type of target that the unit is firing at. So uh, there are quite a lot of modifications that may apply. Sometimes your weapons will be doubled, sometimes the factor will remain the same, uh, sometimes will be decreased. So first you have to check this, which in the end is less complicated than it may look like because in this game in particular you do not have many different types of units. After a turn or two you figure out more or less what modifications apply to what units firing at what units. Then you add together the modified combat factor of the attacking units, you divide it by the defense factor of the target, and you will uh, find the combat odds, which will indicate you the column that you use in the fight table or in the assault table. Then you will roll 1d10, which will be modified by a variety of possible factors, the position of the target, whether or not the target is defending using fortifications, the number of hex sites that you're firing through, closer support, opportunity of defensive fire, just a lot of things that may modify the situation, your role, and also if you are executing a close assault, there is another category of modifiers that may apply based on the number of different types of units that are attacking. If you're combining different types of units in an assault, then you will get several benefits. You cross-reference the column with the die roll and you will have the result which may be that the enemy is eliminated if you uh, find the hex there or the enemy may receive a level of suppression and that is what the S is for. Suppression 1, suppression 2 and so on and so forth. Levels of suppression are recorded using these markers here, which only go up to 4, because if a unit receives a 5th level of suppression, the unit is eliminated. When a unit takes suppression, you place a suppression marker with the red side face up on the unit, indicating the level of suppression that the unit has received later. That marker is flipped to its green side, which means that now the unit can start recovering from suppression, but if you receive further suppression as you're still recovering, the new suppression is added with the red side face up, and I can already tell that different markers to indicate suppression are already maybe too fiddly for some players. 
But this is not all. Suppression has very important effects on the game and they are effects that do influence gameplay a lot. I think that for some players um, managing suppression may be a deal breaker. Why? Because suppression will constantly change the factors of your units. A medium target unit such as this one has its movement value and combat factors reduced by 10% for each level of suppression that the unit receives. Units that are suppressed are more careful, they advance more slowly, they are not as brave when they attack. So in this case, for example, this unit will have movement reduced by 40% and combat also reduced by 40%. However, units that are being careful also have better defense, so the defense of a suppressed unit is increased by 10% for each level of suppression. In this case, this unit has 40% more uh, defense. It works similarly for soft targets, these targets here that do not have any color in the background of their defense value, but for them, the level of suppression <coughs> brings a modification of 20%. In this case, this unit will have the movement and combat factors reduced by 40% and the defense increased by 40%. Of course, there are a lot of other things in this game that add even more depth and layers to the experience, but overall the game is not one of those that where you have to memorize a million rules and sub rules and exceptions. Here the rulebook is not long, the rules are pretty straightforward, do not have many exceptions, so that is not a problem at all. What clearly makes the system uh, complex is something else, is to uh, keep up with all the procedures that you have to execute when all the recomputing of the odds and the stats of your unit it's definitely it is a game that has complexity in the execution more than in learning the rules per se. Um, I personally enjoyed it, I played it as a solitaire game, I haven't played it as a two player game. As a solitaire I enjoyed the puzzle quality that the situation has because the British clearly are trying to run and to do as much damage as possible to the German guns uh, because the Germans will receive uh, reinforcements later in the game so if the British really haven't gained a good position by then then they're mission becomes virtually impossible and on the other hand the Germans uh, really have to do the, the best that they can with their guns. They can have a little more guns, a little more units, a little less units, it depends if you are using optional uh, units or not at setup which you know will make things easier or harder for uh, the German side um, but overall this is the situation. Uh, I as a solitaire I like this puzzle quality trying to solve the puzzle for the British. As a two player game I don't know maybe uh, the British player will love that challenge, the electoral challenge will not mind that things are made so hard because he sees his tanks blowing up one after the other because of the mighty attacks from the 88s. I don't know, this is a big question mark. If you have played the game, two player, uh, please let me know what your thoughts are. Overall, this is a system with remarkable depth. Uh, seeing how the stats of your units changes throughout the game is fascinating. You almost see the psychology of your men that behave differently throughout the game from turn to turn. They become more cautious, less cautious, more aggressive, less aggressive as the game proceeds and that changes in various and slight degrees in both direction, in either direction continuously. It is fascinating. At the same time, of course, it takes homework. There is some homework that you need to do to be able to put that into practice. The combinations of actions that you can do, how you can use your units differently, um, and this continuous interaction between the two sides, up fire and then overwatch. There's a sense of tension, and again, interaction, which is palpable. So, uh, if you're willing to uh, make this investment, to commit to all that the system requires, to uh, be played. This is definitely a system that can give you a lot, it can really give you an immersive, intense experience, but not for everyone.